Um, good evening and welcome to this year's uh, sixth annual John Uri annual lecture. Uh, delighted to have you all with us this evening. Uh, my name is David Tyfield. I'm the Professor of Sustainable Transitions and Political Economy uh, and uh, at the uh, Lancaster Environment Centre, one of the departments here. I'm one of the co-editors of Mobility's Journal and I'm also one of the Associate Directors of Seymour and, and I'll be chairing tonight's proceedings. Um, first though, um, I'd like to invite the uh, Executive Dean for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Professor uh, uh, Simpson, uh, who is a friend of Seymour. He's also an anthropologist in infrastructure, roads and environmental questions. So I'm sure you're going to be very interested in this evening's talk, Ed. Uh, just to say a few words of formal welcome. David, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really at here as the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences to welcome you all to the university. I know many of you are already in the university, so to speak, but for those of you who aren't, uh, I'm here to extend a warm welcome to you and to our speaker, Professor Alice Ma. Welcome. Uh, it's very nice to see you on our campus. Um, as many of you will know, this lecture is to honor one of the university's most distinguished scholars, Professor John Uri. Uh, and as I think John would have liked, the faculty uh, remains a keen advocate for the significance of arts, humanities, and social science in public life, both through research and teaching. I see our subjects as very well placed to tackle the nasty, thorny problems of our age. Um, over the years, I have seen this event uh, as I've watched first from a distance and then more recently from much more close up uh, evolve and become part of the calendar of Lancaster University. Uh, I have followed and I can name the speakers who have spoken in this series without preparing um, for welcoming you this evening. Uh, and I have admired, uh, as I said, from a distance and now much more proximate. So it's a real honor for me to be here to represent the university, to welcome you as guests uh, and as guests online and our speaker, and of course, to remember John as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ed. So as we just heard, um, I'd like to just make a, a little bit more of an introduction to uh, this evening's events, if I can change the slide, hold on. <laughs> so the, the John Uri annual lecture was established by our former <coughs> Vice-Chancellor, Mark Smith, CBE, um, as an indefinite memorial to one of Lancaster University's most illustrious and dedicated members of staff. Professor John Uri, worked at Lancaster from uh, its earliest days in the 1960s, straight from his PhD in Cambridge, uh, until his sudden and untimely death in March 2016. As well as holding multiple senior positions in the university over that period of more than four decades, John also became one of the most influential and highly cited sociologists in the world. His wide ranging and imaginative work fundamentally shaped what are now key avenues and sub or transdisciplinary fields of inquiry in the social sciences, including early work on economies of science and space, work going beyond sociology and an analysis of dynamic and global complex systems, explorations of consumption of space, uh, place and the tourist gaze, and perhaps most famously, work that founded two areas of scholarship that have left enduring institutional legacies here at Lancaster alongside his enduring impact on the sociology department. And we are very grateful to the sociology department for its continued support for this event. First then of these two fields, in his seminal work with Mimi Scheller on the field of mobilities, exploring a social science adequate for a world on the move and no longer adequately in, uh, explained in terms of static container state societies. John also then founded the Center for Mobilities Research, Seymour, which I've already mentioned, uh, which is celebrating 20 years uh, already, uh, and the Mobilities Journal, together with Mimi Shadow and Kevin Hannum, of which I'm now uh, a very proud co-editor. 
at its inaugural conference uh, on alternative mobility futures, Seymour uh, since then has grown into a hub for interdisciplinary uh, mobilities research and an international network of mobilities researchers. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, some of those uh, colleagues today who are here also for the uh, T2M conference, which, uh, of which uh, a hub is being hosted in Lancaster, while the main event is in uh, Concook in Seoul. I also want to thank the Seymour team, uh, Harriet Phipps, uh, Lynn Pierce, and Nicholas Burling for their hard work in helping me uh, arrange this, uh, this evening. Secondly, in his later work, John again led the way in timely interest, exploring social futures after the car or after oil, which will no doubt be extremely relevant to the talk this evening, or facing global climate change, and latterly simply, uh, what is the future? This is now a subject of intense and growing academic interest, and this concern with futures, with social futures, led him uh, with Linda Woodhead to found the Institute for Social Futures in 2015, which continues to go from strength to strength here in Lancaster. Uh, and we are again also very grateful to ISF for their valuable support in organizing today's event. So this event in John's honor is an annual showcase of some of the most prestigious names internationally in so sociology, the social sciences more broadly, with a focus on scholars who are contributing especially to the broad range of interests evident in John's work. So the lecture aims to bring these thinkers to Lancaster uh, for agenda setting public sociology and discussion and a celebration of that work to which John was so committed. And in this spirit, we're absolutely delighted to be welcoming for tonight's uh, annual John Ari lecture, Professor Alice Ma. Just a second, Alice, sorry. You're nearly there. So Alice, Alice Ma is Professor of Urban and Environmental Studies at the University of Glasgow. Uh, she moved there this year. Uh, previously, she was Professor of Sociology at Warwick, and she was the principal investigator on the five-year uh, ERC, European Research Council-funded grant, Toxic Expertise, Environmental Justice and the Global Petrochemical Industry, uh, uh, about which I'm sure we'll be hearing uh, today. Her research and teaching contributions focus on toxic pollution and environmental justice, just and sustainable transformations, and anti-colonial uh, ecological alternatives and futures. Author, uh, Alice is also a prolific author of Petrochemical Planets, as you can see here on the slides, Plastic Unlimited, uh, Toxic Truths, uh, Port Cities, Global Legacies, Industrial Ruination, Community and Place, which was the winner of the 2013 uh, BSA Philip Abrams Memorial Prize, uh, amongst other uh, prizes. Um, so, Alice's talk this evening is on the subject of towards alternative socio-ecological futures, uh, exploring this five-year multi-sited ERC project on the petrochemical industry and plastics uh, as a paradigmatic site of the challenges of constructing different, better relations between human society and the natural environment. And I'm sure that John would have been extremely interested in what we are about to hear, not least given his enduring interests in unequal structural power and what to do about it. Um, the often overlooked in sociology, centrality of fossil fuels to the post-war world and futures, simply. Finally then, before I hand over to Alice, a, a quick running order. Um, Alice is gonna speak to us for roughly an hour. Um, so until about quarter past five, we'll then open up to questions uh, and we'll have about uh, 15 uh, minutes, about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, to end around 6.30, or we'll probably push a little bit beyond that, but not by very much. Um, so without delay, uh, please join me in giving a, a very warm and Lancaster welcome to Professor Alice Marr. Alice. 
thank you for the kind introduction, uh, David, and, and thank you for the introduction from, uh, from the Dean. I'm really delighted uh, to be here uh, and very honored uh, and humbled by this invitation. Uh, so I took this invitation to talk about uh, towards alternative socio-ecological futures. Uh, as I, I took the idea of this as, as an invitation really to explore effectively a kind of ex an existential moment in my own uh, research. So I will be sharing some ideas that emerged from my uh, project on toxic expertise on the petrochemical industry. Um, but I'm also really thinking quite deeply about ecological crisis and what that means and what that means for you know, us as researchers and for future generations. And, and really also thinking at this point uh, that what we need is, I, I guess, humility and generosity and collaboration um, rather than sort of great pathbreaking ideas as such. Uh, so, so, so is it the mouse? Okay. Uh, uh, so, so what I'm going to do today is effectively uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I mean by uh, social uh, scientific perspectives on socio-ecological futures and what inspiration I've taken uh, from thinking through uh, John Uri's work. Uh, and it's been really a, a pleasure. I've, I've read through, uh, um, I mean, I'd read many of his works before, but it was uh, really a wonderful uh, chance to re-engage with that work and, and look through it more deeply. Uh, and then I'm going to, uh, I, I guess, spend uh, much of the talk on uh, this idea of moving beyond critique towards critical intervention, because I think this is one of uh, the challenges within social sciences, and particularly perhaps sociology uh, uh, as, as my uh, discipline. Uh, and I'll, I'll be looking at this through thinking about a very wicked problem, uh, the, the very uh, dirty um, but essential, as, as the industry would call it, global petrochemical industry. And then finally, and this, I guess, is the most exciting thing for, for me, uh, but it's also the most speculative or, uh, um, I guess, still th thinking through it, which is about what kinds of methodologies can uh, we develop or think through to research alternatives and futures? Because I think this is an area where social scientists and sociologists uh, in particular are perhaps maybe not as good at doing. So I really am excited by having what I've read of Sorry, um, Professor uh, John Uri's uh, work. Uh, in particular, uh, the book, What is the Future?, uh, which was his last work, uh, really uh, an insightful uh, look into what kinds of future societies we could have, how, how to research them, and not to let that study of the future and futures and possible futures, um, not to let them be taken over uh, to states, to corporations, and to technologists or kind of uh, economic interests. So this idea of reclaiming the terrain of future studies, as I know many of you here in Lancaster are carrying on that work. Uh, and this important insight uh, that despite the limits of, of planning and modernism and this, I, this kind of impulse to control societies, um, given that these, there are very many long-term processes in, in much of social life, anticipating futures is absolutely essential. And you'll hear that kind of narrative in a lot of the discussions around what to do about the climate crisis, how, to, how we might anticipate that, but also what the kind of dangers are of thinking in, in those ways uh, if you're relying purely on markets or states or, or technology to sort of save uh, the planet. And I'm quite interested as, as well in uh, John Uri's work in this book and in and his wider oeuvre uh, on uh, the importance and the complications, I guess, around a complex systems thinking for analyzing these very uncertain and predictable futures and wicked problems such as the climate crisis. Uh, so very briefly, um, what does critical social science offer uh, to the study of the futures? So I think what is really uh, fantastic about so social science and critical social science in 
particular is, is that role of critique, questioning assumptions about the role of different actors, about their outsized uh, roles of, of you know, marketized solutions, about the role of states and, and you know, all the inequalities that are uh, embedded within that, the vested interests and the power relations between different social actors, um, that firm attention to power relationships and to how very sticky kind of structural uh, issues of, of inequality are uh, through generations and through cultures and histories. And, you know, drawing attention, those deeper issues around injustices, inequalities and patterns. Mm. So, but I think, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been involved in this kind of critique throughout the, you know, this project and throughout a lot of my work. Uh, as a sociologist, and I think sometimes there's a, possibly a little bit too much focus uh, on uh, critique to the extent that everything becomes problematic. You look under the lid of <laughs> pretty much any issue, and then you just see the layers of injustice and uh, and suffering and violence behind that. And I'll go, I'll be a little bit more concrete about that as I talk about the research on the petrochemical industry. But in short, I think that so, so, sociologists, social scientists can be very good at identifying a lot of the obstacles to change, the path dependencies and, and the ways in which uh, structures and you know, capitalism, racism, uh, class inequalities are embedded and reproduced. Uh, they're also very well versed in, in the sort of more, I guess, speculative thinking about, you know, there are, there are long histories of kind of utopian and dystopian thinking, which, uh, um, John's work engaged with quite a lot, took a lot of inspiration in thinking through what are the possibilities in the, I guess, in the far off future or these, uh, or uh, as to whether it would be a catastrophe or whether um, it would be sort of a, 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 yeah, a utopia and what that might look like. Uh, so thinking about the transformative potential basically of, of imagination, of ideas, discourses, uh, for shaping, having a material effect as well as a cultural effect on societies. But, and here's, I guess, uh, where I, I want to make an intervention. I don't know that it's, I, I'm being <laughs> humble here in the sense that I'm not saying that it's as such original, but I think um, that perhaps some of the social scientists are, are not so good at quite practical future-oriented thinking. So, uh, all the kinds of forecasting, predicting, anticipating of futures, all that kind of modeling in a complex city. I mean, that's in the realm of corporations, in the realm of states, and in the realm of work from you know, NGOs as well. Uh, but uh, that kind of what to do that's practical is, is often missed, especially if, it's, if you're coming from a very critical perspective, like a really radical perspective that's saying everything is uh, so um, problematic from the point of view of racism and 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 capitalism, colonialism. Uh, I mean, it, certainly there are exceptions there, but 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 I think uh, the kind of critical intervention I want to make into thinking about futures is less about thinking about the far off future and more about thinking about the edge of the future that we're moving towards, and also thinking about what are the levers. For, for opening up opportunities and pathways towards achieving uh, practical, feasible, yet radical alternatives and futures. Uh, I don't want to be hubristic either, though I don't think it's the, necessarily the job of, of social scientists as such uh, to, to, um, you know, to say what anyone ought to do. But, but I think by identifying some of the levers of power or the openings, then that can lead uh, to opening up possibilities for conversations that might not have been had in the past. So that's sort of the area that I'm interested in looking uh, to uh, in, in, and it's sort of where my latest book, uh, Petrochemical Planet and ends is uh, with that kind of question about futures. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about uh, a particular context uh, for, of moving, of moving and get, and, uh, through from critique to the idea of what you can do about this wicked problem. The research context here is uh, 
uh, from a large European Research Council funded project uh, that I um, led on, uh, it's called T Toxic Expertise uh, on the Global Petrochemical Industry uh, and Environmental Justice. And it involved uh, comparative case study research in, in contexts in the United States, China and Europe, which are the three largest petrochemical uh, producing countries as well as consuming countries. And they have a number of struggles for environmental justice where the petrochemical industry is quite closely located uh, in relation to uh, disadvantaged <laughs> communities, communities of color, working class communities. And this is the subject of a, a new book that's uh, just out on a petrochemical planet, which by the way is open access in case you're interested in following it up. Uh, so uh, just because this is a, a public talk and not everybody knows exactly what petrochemicals are, uh, I'll just um, discuss that a little bit. Uh, so petrochemicals are uh, the, the, they're basically in everything around us. This is a, a corporate, um, um, uh, I guess, brochure about what they're in. They're in 95% of manufactured goods. Uh, they're, they're, you know, in this room every, everywhere. Uh, so they're kind of almost like an invisible basis for modern society. 99% of them currently come uh, from fossil fuels. And there are very big challenges around whether, if at all, it's possible to convert the, the source from them. So they're known as one of the top uh, difficult to decarbonize or hard to abate industries. So, so in the energy transition, this is one of the ones that is going to be the, the most difficult to shift. And many say that leaving aside the politics from a technical and from an economic perspective, uh, it's just not possible. Although you will find also uh, those who are excited about innovation science uh, that they, they might think that that's possible. <laughs> Uh, petrochemicals are also set to become the biggest driver of oil demand during the energy transition. So that's by like mainstream forecasts from the International Energy Agency. Uh, so they say by 2050, that, that will account for the vast majority of the uses of oil, <laughs> largely because it's very difficult to get it from anything else, to make it from anything else. Uh, although, uh, so the, this is an industry, um, uh, pamphlet saying it's so essential, but actually 80% of what they make is plastics. So then you might ask how essential is plastics? Of that 40% uh, of the plastics are in packaging. So you might think about the single waste, uh, single use plastics industry. And they, it accounts for 90% um, of the chemical industry. From a technical perspective, petrochemicals are basically the byproducts of oil and gas and other um, petro, like hydrocarbons that can be made from biofuels as, as, as well or bio-based, bio but that's got its whole set of issues as well. And uh, petrochemicals, they're very diverse, but basically it's impossible to make petrochemicals without having some toxic petrochemicals, particularly uh, the benzene is one of the most widely cited, uh, but there's a whole chain known as the aromatic side of petrochemicals, which are, you know, uh, cancer causing, cause neurological damage and cause health problems across the entire life cycle from the point of manufacture to the point of you know, it being in all this stuff and leaching out to the point of waste disposal where it's being um, burnt. And to, to just, I mean, I, this, this is just to lay the scene uh, to boot. Um, they show no signs of abating. So, so, so the, the growth, there's a, there's a, I haven't added it here, but there's a kind of an exponential growth chart about projected and, and past uh, petrochemical growth, largely driven by plastics, uh, where uh, it's just rising and rising and it's predicted to continue to rise. Uh, to the extent that by 2040, they say that the current levels of 11 million tons of plastic waste entering oceans will rise to 29 million tons with a business as usual model. And even if it was you know, like trying to be as, as green as possible, it'll still be close to that much. And that, and that will still be absolutely nowhere near uh, to addressing the carbon emissions that come throughout the life cycle as well. So it's a really, really tricky 
um, and noxious uh, in industry. So it's wasteful, it's carbon intensive, it's highly polluting, it's pervasive, we all depend on it. And the narrative that the industry uses is that it's essential to life. So, so because it's in your medical equipment and it's in single use plastic um, that, that has life-saving qualities such as during the COVID pandemic with masks and, and so on. So uh, in this book, and, and I think many environmental activists have also made, started to make this connection. There's a lot of focus on the oil industry, which is, I won't get into all the ways in which the corporations work, but some, of, some petrochemical companies are part of oil companies. Some are part of chemical industries. It's a very, it's, it's a field do dominated by a number of really large uh, players that operate at different points in the supply chain, but it's largely kind of hidden in comparison to the more visible oil side and plastic side, but it is actually a really uh, strong and an important player. So it's at the intersection of a number of overlapping crises. When I started doing the research, my main interest was in toxic pollution and health struggles over whether or not uh, this industry is causing health uh, issues in particular communities. Then uh, the more I researched it with my team, the more I saw how it's intimately linked to crises of plastic waste to biodiversity loss due to like poisoning of, of whole um, communities and landscapes and ecosystems, the climate emergency and what has been termed ecological overshoot, like just basically all that masses of, all those masses of um, plastic markets and, and products um, being, you know, rising and rising to, to meet uh, rising population demands and markets. And so that is also something that ecologists have uh, described as, as an ecological issue, although a lot, nobody really wants to talk about uh, uh, consumption. But so that was also an interest of, of um, John Uri's around, around you know, the problems of consumption and, and how you move, how you deal with that issue. Uh, so my work follows uh, the kind of plea of uh, the, the late uh, environmental activist Theo Colburn that we've got to make the fossil fuel connection between um, oil and gas extraction and toxic petrochemicals, particularly in the case of fracking is what she said. Uh, but yeah, more broadly, we, I, I think seeing petrochemicals as a kind of linchpin between a number of these crises is, is, and, and the fact that it evades scrutiny largely because it actually posi positions itself as being different from oil because it's making all these value added plastics that are energy saving. And in my research, I found uh, that uh, the industry actually has a, as, as you might imagine, a very adversarial relationship uh, to um, regulators and to environmental activists and positions itself as being kind of under threat constantly by regulators saying, you know, since the environmental movement started, it's just been this one way street towards stricter regulations. They're, they're, they're actually use a lot of uh, literal military kinds of language about being at war with the public, at, at war with regulators, uh, at reg uh, environmental activists having a knife edge, a knife to their throat, that kind of language. Um, and saying actually that uh, real change in the industry is not gonna happen through basically soft things. It's gonna happen because of either war or legislation. And yeah, there's a whole story about how the industry itself emerged through wartime uh, demands and needs. But because I'm talking about futures, I, I, I'm not gonna talk too much about that just, just now. So basically, I'm, I'm asking this question about transformation. How can, given that this is, uh, you know, a really problematic issue, uh, this toxicity, this wastefulness, this uh, climate destructiveness of this industry that is everywhere and that nobody really wants to do without their computers and, and all the things that are relying on this. So what can we do? How can we transform it? How can you engage with this wicked problem that's very embedded? And uh, one of the ways, I mean, this is about as optimistic actually as, as my book gets, is, is um, through this idea of, of multi-scalar activism, uh, which I'll be talking about in a minute. So the idea here is that there is 
you've seen over the past 10 years, increasing climate mobilization, increasing, you know, discussion of around climate emergency, everybody's being so angry about, uh, you know, plastics, a lot of movement there, a lot of rising ecological consciousness, uh, in, other, in even ways, but around the world, and in rising um, movements that actually come together, like fighting against pipelines, fighting against uh, co coalitions emerging. But I think the, the, the thing about that is you've seen that rising, but it has not made a difference at the same time. And there are figures to show that there's been increasing fossil fuel expansion and petrochemical build out. Uh, so uh, you can, I could uh, show, show uh, if I had a bit more time, how that's linked uh, to very deliberate corporate strategies of how to protect and expand markets. Uh, often deploying actually complexity thinking in their own kind of work uh, to, to be able to try to predict risk and, and try to um, basically game different threats. So what does it mean if there's this disjunction uh, between growing resistance um, and then the, 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 this, like the promise, I guess, of decarbonization, degrowth and detoxification, all things that I think need to happen in the sector and more broadly for other polluting sectors or other aspects uh, in, in other uh, related industries that are causing harm on our planet. Uh, so is that, what does it mean for activism as a lever for change? Because I think there's a lot of idea that if you get out there and you're protesting or you're uh, you know, trying to change uh, legislation uh, through through various actions, then that's going to make a big difference. So yeah, here's <laughs> where I think actually before you even begin there, you need to start thinking about the obstacles. Uh, and I think this goes for, I mean, it depends on what kind of uh, ecolo social ecological future you're thinking about, but I think these are all kind of common obstacles, not just for petrochemicals, but just for the, the planetary threats. So the, the obstacles are the sheer magnitude of, of the ecological crisis that, that do come together. Uh, the climate crisis, toxic pollution, biodiversity, they, they augment one another, many ecologi ecologists have said. Uh, the, the very enormous power of fossil fuel incumbents, so, so those who are, have a vested interest in keeping uh, their profits until the, the very last of the oil runs out, uh, that's embedded in the fact, as you know, Andreas Mom coined the term fossil capitalism, there's that many other different terms uh, about how um, capitalism is intimately uh, linked uh, to fossil fuel expansion and also to legacies of colonialism and slavery uh, with uh, uh, relying, for example, on, on slave labor as uh, a source of energy, as Katrin Youssef argues. Uh, so there's this, in terms of the path dependencies, uh, if you want to look at it in that way, there is systemic and enduring toxic injustice. And if, even if you look back to the history of environmental justice movements, for many centuries, but the, the kind of percolation over, the, over them over the past, since the 80s in the United States where that term first took off through to the last you know, decade or so of, of really intense climate mobilization, the toxic injustice endures and it actually intensifies in many cases. So there have been a lot of failures just as there might've been some cases where there's been compensation offered there's a tremendous sense of petrochemical dependence, which the industry kind of exploits as a narrative, uh, uh, and also the kind of sliding door with states and, and, and finance uh, and so on in terms of who owns uh, the infrastructures, who owns the, the expertise to be able to operate uh, uh, that, those very highly specialized uh, chemical processing plants. And this really firm, aspect to which the, the system is so naughty, so entangled, so embedded, uh, uh, including at the livelihood level, that, it, that there's no way out. Uh, the predominant uh, solutions that have been offered to this in terms of thinking about what are, you know, how do we address, address this? How do we turn it around? Uh, how do we fix this hard to bait industry? Uh, just like with, you know, climate, the climate crisis, 
and the challenging negotiations over the past few decades, the pro prominent solutions are all market-led and technocratic. Not to say that those don't help in some cases, um, but uh, those are usually like the low-hanging fruit and not the kind of really uh, deep issues. Uh, I, I'm not going to lecture on, on geo, the geopolitics of this, but this, I think some of the optimism I felt around maybe 2021 or so has has really shifted and each uh, with, you know, the, the way in which geopolitics plays a, a, a really strong role in, in changing the game effectively, again, in terms of uh, fossil fuel players and uh, conflicts uh, on, on many levels. And then you have the sort of precariousness uh, of resistance movements where they might come together at certain points, but they're also very fragmented and get exhausted with, with the kind of com constant uphill battles. And I've talked to many you know, climate activists actually locally um, where, where I've moved to recently in uh, Scotland uh, and there's a kind of a mood of fatigue uh, uh, around the, the difference between climate activism kind of now and, and the, uh, back a few years ago with the Fridays for Future energies. So I think an, an interesting point thinking about complex systems um, is that there's different ways of thinking about complex systems. One uh, with, which is sort of more positive, which is, uh, I think, more prominent in a lot of the literature and in, in some of John, John's work as well. But the idea that if you think about systems as, as involving complexity and uncertainty and, and dynamism and process, then there's an opportunity effectively to change systems for the better uh, because of the kind of levels of contingency. And by taking on board that kind of analysis, then it's less mechanistic, it's less seeking control. Uh, and it could be a really uh, you know, fruitful and interesting way of understanding uh, and, and, and changing uh, or advocating for change within systems. The problem with complex systems is, is that they could be take any kind of beast in a way. And I think actually the petrochemical industry is a quintessential problem of a complex system, uh, not only because it's a, a complex adaptive system which, which can reproduce itself and, and um, absorb shocks, but also because it knows about complexity science and it actually deploys that in order to try to you know, seek control and to you know, model its own system. So I think in some ways, what I, what I felt researching the petrochemical industry is that they're a step ahead of, of you know, social scientists in that in regard. So all those social scientists and social ecological system theorists would think, say, yes, we're, we're using these methods around complexity to understand and, and um, make sense of uh, the, these uh, interlocking systems and we, where we might intervene in them. But the, the, the level of expertise and kind of financial knowledge, technocratic knowledge, knowledge of conflict zones, they, they've got it all mapped out, uh, is really quite staggering. Uh, so I think it does represent uh, for the petrochemical industry uh, a threat or in some ways in that uh, everything is contingent and they can't control all the factors and they're always um, uh, being beset by crisis, but they thrive on crisis. Every year, I, so I attended a number of petrochemical conferences uh, over the duration of, of, of this project. Every year, it's a new crisis and it's a new existential thing and they just rehearse um, the, the extent of the crisis and what they will do, but then they're kind of, kind of, it's kind of I realized actually it's not an existential thing for, for them in, in some ways, it's, it's just um, what they're comfortable in. And so they have been refining over many decades um, methods of navigating risk, uncertainty and complexity, which do require new modes of resistance. So one of their favorite terms coming from the Cold War is this idea of VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity that's used also in many other industries alongside other kinds of strategy type um, buzzwords around you know, how to model that, how to, how to you know, still make money despite it all. 
so in terms of the research process here, I, I sort of was at first very much struck by how daunting all this was, how complex and, and how impenetrable it seemed, just looking at all these different molecules and so on. Uh, but I started to think about, you know, these sticky notes represent uh, my the understanding of what's toxic about them and where they link to other uh, kinds of issues, kind of reading against the grain of what the industry was saying, which, which ones were the most um, pernicious, where, where they had, um, you know, more robust le legislation. So I think alongside this, and I'm going to move into, <laughs> that was a kind of more depressing bit, uh, but I'm going to move into some emerging new forms of resistance. And they're not totally new. Of course, uh, many uh, activists have been, you know, combining forces for many years. Uh, that's part of the nature of environmental justice. But I think in the face of such high levels of uh, awareness around ecological crisis uh, and uh, yeah, also mediated through um, various forms of communication as well. Uh, there are, uh, there is a sense in which there have been new forms of resistance that are starting to coalesce and to fight back against uh, the harmful expansion of this very heterogeneous oil petrochemical and plastics complex. So uh, one, one of the um, inspirations for thinking about this was uh, the scholar uh, Stuart Hall, who talked about this idea of articulation, processes of articulation and struggles. He was drawing on the work of Antonio Gramsci as his ideas of that there are moments of arbitrary closure or points of articulation within longer term political and cultural struggles in which different elements temporarily unite. So I was sort of thought anti-plastics, uh, climate movements, fisher folk, <coughs> climate activists, uh, like a, a whole range of, you know, Black Lives Matter and a whole range of different uh, kinds of movements coming together in, in various points uh, in, in a kind of a collective struggle, but then maybe dissipating and gathering strength. So this idea that there are points, multi, frontal nodes of activism around this planet that's so uh, impacted by the by petrochemicals. They can work separately as well as in conjunction with one another and their various points of articulation. So that, that's uh, a frame that I, I advance in, in this book. Um, another important aspect of multiscalar activism, I think from a not losing faith kind of idea is that there's often a, a lot of um, talk within movements about how do you scale this up? How do we make sure that it's bigger and the small movement that's happening in, in a particular community uh, can you know, somehow spread elsewhere and have resonance elsewhere? Uh, but I think it's important to think about context here and, and uh, it's not always about scaling up. We can't always make something bigger. Uh, it's also about scaling wide as some uh, authors have talked about or scaling uh, across. It's, it's also, it can also be about scaling down or burrowing below to different levels. Uh, and I think these interventions, uh, two interventions, one by Anna Singh, who talks about this idea that scalability isn't necessarily you know, a good thing. It, it, it assumes smoothing over and it sort of assumes a certain kind of globalization and it, it, it eradicates diversity which she says isn't necessarily a bad thing in this, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So she talks about how, uh, you know, loggers who are unregulated in Indonesia are actually more um, problematic than more regulated ones, even though they're kind of at a smaller scale. So she's not put necessarily valuing that, but just sort of questioning why do you have, why is there this assumption that you need to scale up um, resistance or activism? And Max Liberon and, and Josh Lepowski also talk, uh, question this idea of scaling up and say that really it's more useful to think about scale as relationships that matter within a situated context. So that, that because things don't travel in the same way and you always need to take attention, uh, pay attention to place and to specificity. 
And now I'm going to talk about a few different scales of multiscalar activism before then uh, speaking a, a bit about uh, some ideas around methodologies. Uh, so one of the ways in which uh, there was a, a broad, I, I, could, I, I guess you could say scaled up type of uh, resistance uh, has been in relation uh, to the connection between plastics and climate. Uh, the Break Free from Plastics movement, which started in Southeast Asia, is a, is a really good example of how activists fighting against uh, waste incinerators and the toxic effects of that in their communities uh, linked to the growing plastic waste crisis, which um, became a lot more visible following uh, the, you know, the David Attenborough Blue Planet, all the plastics and um, images in the ocean but also all these images that started coming in around the huge uh, shorelines flooded with plastic waste and uh, quite a lot of convergent in, in terms of thinking and, and reports around how the plastics and climate crises are interconnected. So that's quite, in some ways, quite diffuse as a movement, but it's, but it's uh, looking across the supply chain as well and advocating, you know, for the global plastics treaty and, and all, at, at, and also providing toolkits to different local communities. Uh, another uh, way in which uh, a, a lot of climate uh, activism and petrochemical activism uh, has gained a lot of attention and, and force and solidarity is, is through uh, indigenous pipeline resistance uh, mobilizations that have happened around the world. The most uh, well-known uh, perhaps is the Standing Rock uh, where it was sort of at, at that time it was an unprecedented number of uh, people coming together from a number of different communities I think in the tens of thousands uh, and the the other image here is actually in the area that I come from uh, in northern British Columbia uh, on wet, unseated wetsuit and uh, land where they've been re resisting pipelines uh, for the past, you know, over a decade, and it's uh, reached kind of a, a boiling point around the same time as, as the Standing Rock. Uh, and yeah, the, the idea uh, in many of these indigenous pipelines resistance uh, mobilizations, as uh, McCurry and Turner uh, say, is, is that actually in, in, in some of these uh, resistance movements, the uh, the main indigenous leaders uh, are articulating the politics of territorial defense within a multi-scalar conception of responsibility. So they're saying that it's not just about their own territory or their own people, it's about the land and it's about the relations between them and it's about struggles in other communities and working together. Uh, and so that's quite a nice idea that it's, it's coming from uh, uh, yeah, position of connection and solidarity. So just a few uh, short vignettes from some of my uh, fieldwork with, with my team, uh, looking at some of elements of multiscalar activism. One was in uh, the area known as Cancer Alley in uh, between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, which has the highest concentration of petrochemical facilities in uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, 150 uh, petrochemical plants, more or less, uh, around eight oil refineries, and it has and has been at the forefront of environmental justice movements, built on former slave plantation land, uh, with predominantly rural Black communities who live there, who are descended from slaves in the in the area, uh, and. Uh, Cancer Alley in this in this area, St. James Parish has been. Uh, you know, they've, they've got many many petrochemical facilities in their uh, town. They've been resisting for for a long time. Uh, and when a proposed pipeline, which is like the the Bayou Bridge pipeline, which was meant to be the end of uh, the the uh, the one that went through Standing Rock, was proposed to go through there, there was a coalition <coughs> between. Uh, indigenous activists who were uh, fighting the pipeline on grounds of uh, that were sort of taking inspiration from the Standing Rock protests alongside uh, and working alongside uh, the 
African-American leaders there, many from different faith groups. Unfortunately, the pipeline was, was built and that uh, movement actually, it got a little bit of media attention, but it dissipated uh, and it didn't get anywhere near the same kind of attention as Standing Rock. So not so many people know about it now, uh, but I thought it was quite a, a telling and evocative quote from one of the key indigenous water protectors at that camp talking about the reflections on failure, saying um, we have to tell people that it's not just all right to fail, but it is a necessary part of contributing to protecting our planet. Future generations don't need ancestors who only found value in obvious, immediately measurable wins. They need us to be willing to fall on our faces over and over until we and they can all win. To me, that would be the greatest success, maybe the only success that matters. I'm going to return to thinking a little bit about the lessons of failure in a minute. I'm going to, we're going to take the shipping <laughs> flows uh, that were from, from uh, North America, where all those pipelines were being built for, uh, across to China, where a lot of the petrochemical markets are. This is an LNG container shipping uh, fracked gas. Another area in which we did research uh, was in Nanjing in China, which is a traditional petrochemical hub. So this is an area uh, which is a mega city on the Yangtze River, and it's, in, and it's seen as a, being a very dangerous uh, zone because it's completely encircled by either petrochemical heavy industry areas or hills or, or water. So basically the local government has said, this is really dangerous. If there's an accident, which there are many accidents that are deadly in China, um, then it, there would be a tra trapped polluted air and then people wouldn't be able to escape. This is because it's a very traditional uh, man manufacturing hub and because of uh, many of the enterprises are state owned, uh, uh, by tradition, I mean, since the 1950s and 60s, there's actually been very, very little protest in this uh, area as compared with some of the more uh, well-known protests against um, peroxylene plants, uh, where th those are happening in more kind of middle-class, uh, larger areas and cities. So this is an area where we went to because it had a high concentration of petrochemical plants and because, precisely because there was a little bit less controversy. So it was uh, explicitly anyway, so it was a little bit easier to get access to uh, and I went there with a, yeah, a Chinese researcher, uh, Xing Hong Wang, uh, back in 2016. And there, uh, we sort of noticed that there was actually quite a lot of uh, environmental activism, but it was very subdued. And this followed a lot of the research uh, about environmental activism in China, where uh, because of the political constraints, like it's actually not legal to, to protest uh, in the same way as here, <coughs> trade unions aren't allowed. Uh, the NGOs and environmental activists have to work in very close relationship with the state and with authorities uh, in order to be able to promote their agendas. So this has been termed embedded activism by, by Ho and resigned activism by Laura Wainwright and others have written about uh, this and also challenged it because it's obviously a very diverse uh, country. And yeah, we, we did a follow-up research, um, myself and uh, Loretta Lowe, another researcher in the project uh, in 2018, uh, where one of the uh, environmental groups had been doing very intensive local monitoring of, of, the, of the petrochemical plant, including like uh, sort of not exactly subterfuge, but, but kind of going out and doing their own sampling and, and kind of crossing fences and, and doing, producing reports uh, for, for the company itself and working very, in very close relation with them to try to improve their environmental monitoring in the area. And they sort of said, you know, that, that that's the best, the most practical way to do so, uh, that they're trying to change uh, the, the situation, but they say that the culture there has its characteristic and that people are termed large turnip from the saying every turnip to its whole. So, so there's only so much that you can sort of change in that system. So it's a really kind of micro activism 
where they're they're trying to change a, quite a very dire situation in, in the sense of like fish fish ponds where all the fish are dead, deadly leaks at, at night, noxious smells, uh, visible pollution, and and not the same kinds of debates either as in somewhere like Cancer Alley or in places we looked in Europe where people are just saying, yeah, it's it's deadly, yeah, it's dangerous. Like there's no debate about whether it's unhealthy. It, it's sort of accepted that that's the case. It's just a matter of how they um, put themselves out of harm's way. Uh, and so I think that the, the point that, I mean, I, if, if that's the most hopeful aspect, I, I guess that's not very ho hopeful, but I thought it's interesting the extent to which the activism um, continues despite failures, despite uh, setbacks and despite differences of scale. And I really love this idea from uh, a wonderful book called Our History is the Future by Nick Estes, who is uh, one of the activists at Standing Rock, an indigenous scholar who reflects on Karl Marx's revolutionary figure of the mole breaking through to the surface. Uh, and he says that, you know, revolution is a mere moment within the longer movement of history. The mole is easily identified on the surface by counter-revolutionary forces if she hasn't adequately prepared her subterranean spaces, which provide shelter and safety. Even when pushed back underground, the mole doesn't stop her work. Hidden from view to outsiders, this constant tunneling, plotting, planning, harvesting, remembering, and conspiring for freedom, all things that he says his tribe, the Sioux tribe, uh, do. Uh, the collective faith that another world is possible is the most important aspect of revolutionary work. It is from every life that the collective confidence to change reality grows, giving rise to extraordinary events. So bo both in a way are kind of very different reflections on both the US and the, um, and the Chinese case that are sort of uh, re reflections on meanings of failure or of having to go underground or having to deal with setbacks but keep on struggling. I've reflected a little bit on uh, the, the, the implications of, I guess, the more militaristic strategies. I, 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 and, you know, the, the, that quip by the, the scientists who said that either war or legislation are what will actually make the industry change. And I should say that there, you know, there is a lot of act, activism in, on, the, on the legal side uh, in relation to dealing with this crisis. The most prominent is the ongoing negotiations uh, surrounding uh, the landmark uh, mandate for a new global treaty to address problems across the full life cycle of plastics, which uh, was agreed in 2022, and they're entering a new round this year, uh, kind of like a paragraph agreement for plastics. So it's a UN uh, forum uh, to, to legislate against the most uh, toxic aspects of, of um, Pet plastics and petrochemicals, including at the production side of the, uh, the petrochemical industry. And there have been, you know, bans have been also quite effective in, in reducing the number of um, toxic chemicals that leach or, or that are, you know, pose problems for health. So the European Union uh, uh, unveiled plans for the largest ever ban on chemicals in, in 2022. And it's, it's also still facing you know, pushback and, and challenges. Uh, so it's, it's effectively been, those are some examples, uh, but it's, it's often the case that there's an uphill battle against fossil fuel interests uh, and, and lots of loopholes in a lot of these arrangements. So uh, although the industry will say, oh, it's a one-way street about the regulations coming after them, from the other side, you really need to keep up the pressure uh, to develop stricter binding uh, regulations to keep industry from uh, um, doing whatever it feels like, which it has shown that it will do. Uh, so I'm going to uh, conclude um, this, this, this talk in, with a final, final set of ideas, which are sort of largely speculative uh, and in the spirit of, of the idea of thinking about futures and, and new ways of thinking through that um, about researching and anticipating or proposing alternative socio-ecological futures on the basis of what 
I've learned and where I am at the moment. And I mentioned in the beginning that I'm kind of, it was a slightly, maybe an existential moment or, or something. Uh, just to elaborate on that, uh, yeah, having researched the very closely toxic injustice over the past you know, seven or eight years, now I really am sort of thinking, I, I don't know if I can look at that anymore. I really think that we need to work on healing and need to work on really thinking about, not just about damage, but moving beyond a damage-centered approach, like the indigenous scholar Eve Tuck um, talks about. Um, but I also do think, and I can't overcome that sociological inclination and to look that it's so important to map out, to recognize, to understand the barriers and obstacles um, and, and what's at stake, because it's not just a case of thinking, oh, it would be lovely to have a degrowth society where nobody, you know, used all the all this, um, you know, Car, cars and didn't consume so much, or, or it would be lovely if we lived in communes and had urban gardens and so on. Um, but how do you get there? So that's the question that I'm quite interested in. So what, one of the things that I think is really interesting as an agenda is about anticipating and designing just transitions. Uh, so the, the just transition is you know, a very big policy, uh, mainstream word now emerged in the trade union movement, this idea that we need to you know, transition away from fossil fuel intensive kinds of jobs, dirty jobs towards more green jobs and um, better livelihoods uh, and to protect those workers and communities who lose those livelihoods. But it needs to be proactive, I think, rather than reactive, not after the um, jobs have been lost. And we need to ask just for whom, because a lot of those debates also don't consider if you're gonna build the green jobs, the wind turbines and, and so on, where are the supply chains coming from and, and what are the knock-on effects of that? And they need to be you know, also thinking about not just next generation, but the generation after and many future generations bringing on board more uh, deep time thinking Relatedly, I think a lot of the gen just transitions literature, uh, all, while it's very focused on ensuring everybody that it's just for everybody, it doesn't really think, spell out an idea of, of, of that vision. And I think degrowth and postgrowth are um, doing that work around thinking about what kinds of societies uh, would make sense in the future uh, or, or now. Uh, so thinking about uh, work that's happening within planning actually around like how do we plan instead of thinking of pro-development planning thinking about um, building degrowth and post-growth into our urban environments so just a few I, I think I can't I can't help the the sort of social so the, the critique angle of, of, of sociology so you can see flaws in a lot of these ideas as well and I think it's important to be aware of those I think within degrowth, uh, I'm very attracted to this, especially from the perspective of petrochemicals, because it challenges unsustainable growth models, and this is really crucial. Um, but if you look at the vast majority of degrowth scholarship, apart from, I guess, quite recently, thinking about uh, fossil fuel transitions a little bit more, a lot of the examples are focusing explicitly on, on basically peripheries of capitalism, less on questions of transition. So things that are, and they say deliberately, it's sort of like an experimental space on the edges or in islands or in common spaces um, that are kind of not facing uh, the, the, the kind of the, the thorny wicked issue uh, head on. And I think uh, Arturo Escobar has a really interesting response to this actually because he sees he has this idea of around designs for transitions or designs for what he calls the pluriverse which is actually um, the idea of how you do think about transformation within an industrial capitalism I should say actually Escobar for the vast majority of this work is talking about autonomous indigenous movements and communes and, and kind of spaces outside of industrial heartlands uh, and he talks about the need to protect that, and it's it's really important and inspiring work. But then he he does reflect towards the end of the book. He says, 
for those of us who live in the delocalized and intensely liberal worlds of middle-class urban modernity, the historical imperative is clearly that of re-communalizing and re-territorializing. Um, so this idea that we need to imagine these new forms of communalism uh, that are appropriate to this particular age of unsettlement. And so they, he says, for those of us without an ancestral mandate to help our words, world persevere. So for those of us who are not indigenous and lived on land, uh, but have moved or migrated or uh, you know, moved, uh, been affected by modernity, the question becomes, how do we create and re-communalize our worlds? So I, I find that's a really inspi inspiring uh, intervention about thinking about next steps forward. The, the idea that I would love to work on going forward, because people ask me a lot about, about what, what do you do now? They've just finished this book, apart from recovering from uh, the, you know, uh, sort of the difficulty of looking at actually. Um, I, I'm actually really taken by the idea of complexity analysis in that more positive sense. But I think what needs to happen is maybe not as actually to catch up with the petrochemical industry who's got, who's got the some elements of complexity analysis nailed, but it's actually to do it really differently. Not to say that people aren't already doing that, but to think about different ideas of how you might plan and design futures if that's what's necessary, if it's necessary to anticipate futures, how to think about scenarios without having the kind of icky aspect of it being really co-opted by businesses. How do you embed planetary deep time thinking? So thinking about not just like next decade, but hundreds of years from now and, hundred, and how that relates to hundreds of years in the past. That's definitely something that social scientists aren't, aren't typically practically looking at, although they might, there's obviously theories around it. And so I had some initial ideas, which I would be interested to see if there's any resonance with what your thoughts are doing this kind of work on thinking about like, maybe you could do oral histories with people from different older generations who have memories of their older generations or have documents or recordings scattered from before and not having a bifurcation between, you know, it's happening in this sort of relational way and in certain kinds of societies like an indigenous society or a society in um, rural areas, but actually every society has that history has a history of alternatives. Even within modern cities, there's, you know, there's all kinds of ways of thinking differently, being differently that are embedded. Uh, and some of those ways of oral, doing oral history might be stretching through to thinking about, you know, migrant histories, like thinking, you know, like my grandfather was, you know, was from a rural area, rice producing in, in China. I, I don't have a connection with that that I visited it recently and I was really intrigued by that connection, but also saw some of the gendered issues of inequality there and, and you wouldn't want to reproduce or romanticize those sorts of changes. So that's one, th one thought. And during, yeah, thinking more uh, robustly about uh, socio-ecological system thinking, the idea of tipping points uh, and how you might uh, do work together uh, beyond the social sciences with natural sciences uh, to think through what that looks like because there's still a lot of disagreement as to whether we're on a tip like what what the nature of the tipping point it is whether we've already crossed it I'll get that to into to that in just a moment and then what I think would be really interesting and this is sort of what I've tried to do a little bit in this book but I only just dipped into it is this idea of reading against the grain and challenging as assumptions of existing models um, within social science um, and thinking about different kinds of ethics. So rather than just taking the reports that are from the IPCC or various scenarios and, and, say, and repeating those statistics or facts or um, you know, what was sort of very technically bounded in terms of knowledge, actually thinking, you know, could we do something differently if we rely on our diverse forms of knowledge and methodologies that are actually more maybe about storytelling um, as well as about the figures. This is a reference to Beyond the Limits of uh, the Limits to Growth, which was a, one of the early complexity kinds of thinking. I think planetary deep time thinking is, you know, really important for thinking about uh, 
you know, this idea of deep time uh, and the relationship between uh, the earth and uh, human societies in the scale of the climate crisis. And here I refer to some of the scholarship, including here at Lancaster on this, this turn to the planetary and thinking, thinking about the planetary as opposed to the global, the planetary as being a space that is more subaltern as some post-colonial scholars say, more connected to deep time and, and that it's a bit different from the global, which is more associated with capitalism. And then these sort of tensions between universalism, which has its dangers, as Chakrabarty says, um, but also um, it's, it's clearly the case that there, there's a universal aspect of, of, of the planet. So then uh, just, this is the most speculative I get in the book. Um, will there be a moment when of ecological tipping point? Are we gonna get a, what could happen that would dislodge the petrochemical dependence? Uh, I, I kind of like this idea of William Connolly where he thinks envisages this po politics of swarming, uh, which is a complex systems idea emerging organically in response to ecological crisis which resembles a swarm of birds. And he says it's composed of multiple constituencies, regions, levels, and modes of action, each carrying some potential to augment and, ident and intensify the others with which it becomes associated. But, and this resonates with Yuri's idea of um, herding, or this idea that people, that systems and social uh, relations end up imitating or copying within these complex systems. And that can magnify problems and lead to system failure. But then you might say, which way is it going to go? <laughs> because that's the problem with what the complex systems and intervention with them. You don't know which way it's going to go. <clears throat> so that I think that could equally apply to, you know, the multiscalar activism, or it could apply to, you know, you don't really want to think what the other side of it is. And many have already said that it is too late for to turn it around, especially from indigenous scholars who say, really, actually we crossed the tipping point long ago. And I really take to heart Kyle Powers' White's idea that actually what he calls the relational tipping point. So the, those are relational qualities of consent, trust, accountability, reciprocity, that togetherness that got crossed long ago because of systems of colonialism, capitalism, and industrialization. Uh, so, he, def he contrasts that with the ecological uh, tipping point and saying, you know, there's, there's no going back it, because it, precisely because it takes so long to heal. Uh, so to build up those re relations takes a lot of time. Uh, which brings me uh, to my, my last um, point in relation to methodology. I think more and more, uh, I, and this has been actually quite, um, challenging for thinking about new research. Like, how do you do new research? I and mean, probably many of you share this uh, climate, climate friendly research where you don't go anywhere or, or um, where you don't research the other by going into different communities that aren't your own. Like, then you wouldn't be able to do research. Um, so, but I, th I think that Max Lieberman's idea in pollution is colonialism of anti colonial ethics is a really interesting provocation and starting point. Um, which where they argue that colonialism is basically defined as the ins assumed entitlement to use land as a sink like for pollution uh, and for other forms of violence. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an assumption, if you extend that to social science, that you can just go into a community and collect data without the permission of the people whose land it is. And they ask, how will we do science in an anti-colonial way rather than merely with intent? And they offer up this idea based in their indigenous um, connections and, and other scholars around thinking about accountability of relationships, um, of relationality based on obligation for, to others, where that obligation is understood as another way of saying gratitude. And above all, um, they emphasize this idea that I've started with, this idea of humility. So, the, yeah, uh, trying to end in a, an optimistic note after all, such a challenging and slightly depressing overview. Uh, I, th I, I think the, the, the steps towards uh, 
alternative socio-ecological futures are through forms of interconnection, solidarity, and resonance, um, through small everyday actions in everyday life, as well as larger struggles, through humility of one's own um, position, of one's own, you know, ideas, willing to relearn and, and unlearn and learn again, uh, or learn anew instead of holding on fast to one's own beliefs. Uh, through extending in a generous way, um, multiscalar responsibility beyond um, your uh, own communities, but according to one's own capacities and positions, because obviously not everybody is privileged enough to be able to have that capacity, uh, especially if they're you know, suffering. Um, through engaging, I think this could be explored further with complexity thinking, the socio-ecological side rather than the neoliberal side, and with more embedded kind of planetary deep time thinking that also thinks of the more than human and multi-species world. And yeah, just to uh, conclude, given what we're up against, it can't entirely be gentle. We're up against, you know, players that are seeing this as war and have very nasty tactics. So you need to continue to fight where it's required for social and environmental justice and alternative futures across different sites and scales. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Alice. That was uh, remarkable. Thank you so much. Um, you stay here, right? Well, perhaps why don't you go in the middle, okay. and um, and I will um, take questions. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot to think of, think through, think of your questions. Any hands uh, for questions for Alice? Great, thanks. Uh, thank you, Alice. That was fantastic. I, I really enjoyed you opening up this sort of inflection point in your research career and sort of um, clearly recognizing, you know, all the insights you've got from what you've done, but asking yourself really hard questions about where you go next. It's fantastic. Um, as somebody who's also sort of been at various points a bit immersed in the chemical and petrochemical world, one of the things that's always struck me is the sheer material scale of what we're dealing with. So I was on the ferry at Europort at Rotterdam looking out over this sea of oil tanks. And as far as you could see in one direction, it was just oil, petrochemicals, chemical. I mean, and you drive through the port and it takes you 30 minutes to get from one end of this to the other. So the sh just sheer material sunk investment, the scale of infrastructure and so on. And the, the idea of what, how do we imagine the transformation of that landscape, those, those places? What could their future be? Is it a future of abandonment? What does transition mean in a material sense? So I, I, it was, I suppose it's a question of your reflections on the, some of the materiality of this and of the, both the sort of, how that materiality holds things back, but but what is it? What do we what do we mean for the future of those sorts of places, or for Cancer Alley as well, and that amazing concentration of infrastructure? Mm. Should I answer that now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, it's uh, that that's the embedded, <laughs> locked in as aspect of it. I mean. I, I think that if at some kind of global level, just as there was agreed, at, you know, in the various um, conferences of the parties on, on climate change, that we need to phase out fossil fuels, so a mandate to phase out fossil fuels, to see petrochemicals as actually part of that problem would go a long distance. Currently, it's not really, it's sort of like, mm, can we find a technological fix to sort of still keep it and still keep the same levels of consumption? Uh, but you kind of have your cake and eat it kind of too. So I think there has to be a recognition at, at many levels that this is what needs to happen. 
then linking to the kind of just transition thing, I think where that is actually totally doesn't resonate with people, with workers, is that there's nothing realistic put on the table in those communities. So, so you know, leaving aside all, all the kinds of other, you know, political, cultural aspects, if you can't see what it is, you can't imagine what it is, if there's nothing concrete, like, uh, you know, a, a, a new project that, that involves, you know, different roles and different forms of learning that leads you there and you can see what the pathway there is, then why would you uh, go, go for that? So I, th I think there needs to be, you know, that's why I think that, that, that that's where the work needs to happen is on anticipating, designing, instead of just saying, oh, let's just wait till the catastrophe happens and then you clean it up. Because we've seen that you can do, do that. Uh, but yeah, it, the more you look at it, the more it's, it's quite um, you know, fright, frightening from that perspective. And I had uh, you know, a, a, a funny, well, not funny, but I had an interview with someone who's very, very optimistic about, about transitions. Uh, for like a kind of a radio thing uh, about a year ago and she was just she, but at the end of it she said oh yeah it's a, sort of a di difficult sticky wicked thing yeah there, but you know what it, it's really reassuring that there's there's thousands of these sites around only thousands that's a number <laughs> and so like oh <laughs> well, that's about as about as optimistic as you can get but yeah I, I don't know I mean I, I also think that this imperative that that I don't know we're often called upon as scholars and also as you know activists or, or members of communities to just say there's hope it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna we're gonna start it out maybe you know it's, it's well it's, gonna, it's certainly going to be more messy than we think but yeah political will at, at many levels is, is definitely essential yeah, th thank you very much, Alice. I found that really inspiring and energizing and uh, resonant with, with a lot of the things that we've, we're talking about here at Lancaster. Um, got two questions, really. Um, one is, what do you think the role of uh, law is in resistance? So I'm thinking of client earth, but I'm also thinking about illegal actions and uh, the role of violence against structural, the, the structures that um, Gordon was talking about. Um, and th the other question is, what do you think the actual effects of climate change are playing in this, coming from Scotland now with all the floods? What, what difference does that make? Well, those, those are very big <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the first question, the role of law and the role of Legal actions, yeah. Uh, when I did, I mean, in a way, by you asking me that, I, like you, anybody probably knows as much as any anyone else. I mean, I, I think one thing to, to say is is that having observed the industry and its conferences and its documents, they by and large do care a lot about what the law says and what the regulation says and what the repercussions are for not doing it. And so they actually. Like a lot of my learning about the many, many international regulations and multi different levels of regulations are, is is actually from those kinds of uh, meetings. So they they care a lot, but they're constantly looking for like the wiggle space, and so that's why I think going back to that question around like what needs to happen if there was a global mandate that was binding that said this you know we're not states are no longer sub the other. Um, aspect that I didn't go into too much is that many of these are large state-owned enterprises. There's, there, there, it's not just financial capital, it's, it's states and, and their interests in, in self-sufficiency and geopolitics and so on. Uh, so there's a lot uh, there. But if, if there, yeah, I think legislation is very, very important as a tool, but there's a lot of ways in which, uh, unless it's sort of followed through with, then it, that it doesn't stick. With the illegal side, I mean, I know, I know, I mean, I've read uh, Mom's work on blowing up a pipeline, and I know that there's um, people at the end of COP26 where I was, where there can't be activism as, as usual. Uh, but 
yeah, I think there's definitely a, a role for for direct action, and and it's possible that that will we'll see more and more of of that. At the moment, going back to the tipping points thing, I don't see that as being like uh, you know the the big thing that's that's really going to at the moment tip things in a particular direction. But but yeah, I, I think it's probably going to happen more. Uh, but in itself, at the moment. It's one part of that. That's why I, I like this idea of different points in a struggle where they're all where we have that solidarity, but you might not be taking the same kind of action. Uh, and then the second question about <laughs> the in, impacts of climate crisis. I mean, I, I I don't I don't know because the 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 denial aspect of climate is 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 actually having quite interesting impacts in, even on the front line. So, so I was in, I, I come from Canada. I was in Canada over the summer. I, yeah, I did fly because I wanted to see my family. Um, and, and yeah, I live uh, visiting a, you know, a forest town where we actually got stuck for a few days on a wildfire um, frontier and talking in, you know, in the local papers, there's a lot of people saying, oh, they're just making all this stuff up where, you know, it has nothing to do with climate. It's because the fire people are, you know, corrupt and the government. So, so yeah, I, I don't know that that on the ground lived experience of uh, climate, um, you know, effects is necessarily going to tip it, it because it it causes, you know, fear. It plays on anxieties. It, it people reach to whatever they might have in their heads, and that might not be, you know. The, the green movement that's finding the comfort. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's a, I think it's an interesting, but probably quite challenging research topic to think about. If people don't mind, we'll take one more question. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, I found that really interesting. And as someone who spent quite a lot of time in a room with discussions with government where there are corporate lobbyists there, I totally <laughs> relate to your <laughs> picture of how that works and the war analogies and, and so on. Um, uh, my, my question is about the people who are employed in the petrochemicals industry and not so much sort of on the front line in factories where, you know, they're very locationally specific jobs and, you know, people probably take them because it's the only job they can do in the town they live in but more at the sort of professional level like you know like the lobbyists the strategists the you know the accountants those sorts of people what what stories do they tell themselves about the work they're doing because you know I have no doubt that there will be some very cynical people who are just in it for the money but most people want to be able to tell a story of being on the right side of history <laughs> so you know what 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 do you think these people are thinking and do you think that that is a potential route for is there a potential route for engagement and mobilization of people from within the industry or is that hopelessly optimistic uh, thank you that's a really good question so so i did i did i didn't touch on this but i did do a number of interviews with uh, various petrochemical um, executives and, and professional workers as well. And I mean, there, many do show what you would call cognitive dissonance where they say, yeah, I feel that bad, but at the end of the day, I have to pay my wages and we don't, we're not as bad as the oil side of things. We're helping, trying to improve things. So there's that side of it. Uh, the most uh, I, I think disheartening one though wasn't wasn't so much those who are just don't care or those who kind of talk a little bit about conflicted ethics. It's ones who actually flip the justification around where they they reposition themselves as being basically the saviors. So they'll say, well, the chemical industry we're we're holding our hands up. We've we've made some mistakes, but we are actually going to produce the solutions to fix this. We're way not at all as bad as oil because we're making value added things that save people's lives. They genuinely believe that. Not only that, they're doing uh, philanthropic work where they're um, educating people in Southeast Asia about their plastic waste problems. 
going and doing beach, beach, clean, beach cleanups. Uh, they're putting lots of money into that. And those are, so that's the, they're in a lot of the, 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 the mentality is a kind of self justification where they might give a little bit of ground. Okay, it's not perfect. It hasn't been perfect in the past, but they're okay because they're 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 ta they're li listening to the hard lessons and they're they're it's all about green chemistry and sustainability and a kind of a niche to, to change things and a, a very strong narrative of the chemical industry is like the quintessential innovator it will innovate again and it will save uh, the planet and it will sell all the green products including it being in all the wind turbines and all the solar panels and and piloting uh, green hydrogen so uh, and I don't think that's in, I think it's just part part of the I don't know the psychological aspect of justifying to yourself what you do but not being able to look beyond those lies that you tell yourself so that yeah it's a, there's a range and there's yeah there probably are those who are disaffected as well they're having problems with recruiting younger people <laughs> more diverse people so it could change over time yeah Thank you so much, Alice, um, for those answers. Very, very illuminating and for your wonderful uh, talk. Um, thank you all also for staying uh, beyond the, the original scheduled time. Uh, please join me again in uh, giving our thanks to Alice for a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>